with the 2024 Olympics right around the corner, this beautiful city is getting spit and polished for the world to descend upon it next July. It's so exciting to be here and see all the work that's going on to, uh, to really celebrate sport. Well, you know me and the crazy Looney Tune worker outer that I am. I'm so excited because I just learned at the Museum of Decorative Arts, just down the street at the Louvre, uh, there's an exhibition called, are you ready for this? Fashion and Sport, from one podium to another. So this is a retrospective of all athletic gear throughout the ages. I'm sure it's going to have a whole bunch about tech and how far we've come. So I'm anxious to get over there and see what it's all about and share it with you. So I'm going to strap up. Of course, I got to wear my sneakers and take you over there and we'll check it out. And along the way, I'm going to show you some really interesting things that I have learned like where certain events are gonna be held, the center point for the opening ceremonies. Can you imagine six kilometers of entertainment, one billion viewers, over 600,000 spectators, Paris, its river, its monuments, all on display. It's gonna be extraordinary. Okay, girls, let's go. Imagine 160 boats with athletes on them representing their countries coming up the river Seine and ending up right there under the Eiffel Tower in a place called Trocadero. Mobs of people on either side of the banks of the Seine howling for their countries and Olympics like no other. Okay, approaching the Museum of Arts Decorative. Here we come. Can't wait to see this. Here we are in the garden of the Louvre. It is such a beautiful, beautiful place. And by the way, Mitch and I had lunch there one time. It's called Lulu and wow, is it delicious. But here is the Museum of Decorative Arts that we're just about to go walk into. Let's go. Look at this racket from the 1840s. It's very, very interesting. Look at this fabulous china dish of the two men playing tennis. And then, of course, an ode to the women who in the 19th century would play, they were expected to play indoor and out, uh, a variation of, ten of tennis in long dresses, and they would have to tuck up their trains under their arms in order to not trip. Saddle up, horse riding, hunting, archery, and fencing were utilitarian activities that over time became physical hobbies. And in the 18th and 19th century, of course, women rode side saddle. And uh, the elegance of their, their habits would then change from silks to wools and uh, more utilitarian fibers. Look at that beautiful hat that uh, a woman equestrian would wear. And that looks like a polo helmet. In the 19th century, gymnastics became a typical method for keeping the body healthy. Gymnastic manuals explain to practitioners the correct moves to mobilize and relax their muscles. First intended as a military exercise, the manuals later were recommended for children, children's education, and for women as early as the 1820s. And this, of course, was uh, where the fabrics of the clothing started to change. Bloomers were invented so that women uh, didn't have to worry about exposing themselves. And of course, lighter fabrics were then worn. Here's an example of uh, gymnastics with ropes and pulling. Very interesting. As the fabrics of the athletic clothing started to change, this was where the footgear changed. 
in the 18th century from street shoes to cleats. In the 1800s, elegance was still beating performance. Look at some of the garb that the gals would wear as they played tennis, although it was made from lighter fabric and perhaps a, a pocket or two were at, was added to hold the balls. But look at that corset. Oh Lord, can you imagine bending over to pick up a ball in that? Riding to liberty. With the invention of the bicycle in the 1880s, men had an access to a new form of transportation, but also a new leisure activity. The famous Tour de France began in 1903. To participate, men wore knitted jersey and narrow shorts for greater aerodynamics. For women, dressed dresses, the staple of good taste and manners were not well adapted to bicycle riding. In the United States, Amelia Bloomer wore pants under her skirt and then gave her name to Bloomers. Who knew? more practical for riding a bike. While the first modern Olympic games were played by amateurs, athletes' professionalism mattered over the time that was spurred to the need for more performative equipment. It was in the 1920s that Lacoste came up with the very first polo shirt. This is when Rene Lacoste cut off the sleeves of a shirt so that a player and athlete could move around far more freely. Hence the polo shirt. Dive in from bathing to swimming. Look at some of these costumes that the women of the 18th century would have to wear. There would even be corsets underneath these swimming ensembles. Actually, this one over here is kind of cute. I would wear that today. <laughs> love that. In the 1920s and 30s, marked by a cult of youth, sports were all the rage. Fashion magazines were filled with articles on various sporting activities and their appropriate clothing. These passions didn't get behind the door for all the designers out there. They decided to create beautiful and comfortable and casual styles, still chic though. Sportswear, a term first encountered in the French press in the late 1920s, was born. Sliding and skating from the ice to the sidewalk. Ice skating has long been appreciated in the city, but the mountains drew more and more adventurous amateurs from the 19th century onward. The clothing worn in climbing expeditions was only slightly different from the country or hunting wear. In 1938, Henrietta Angerville climbed Mont Blanc wearing trousers designed for the occasion. Thanks to a new train line, the Alps became accessible to the turn of the 20th century, and it was fashionable to sojourn the St. Moritz and later make grief. We've come a long way, baby. Sportswear is the new black. In the second half of the 20th century, sports were everywhere. Of course, there were so many social revolutions happening at the same time. And it was when, in 1980, sportswear really underwent a revival and a more general context of the value placed on sport as part of a healthier lifestyle. Vogue actually came up with a new magazine, Vogue Sport because they knew they had their finger on the pulse of the world. It was no longer simply to dress in a sporty manner as it was in the, the 1920s and 30s, but it was to incorporate sports clothing into everyday wardrobe. In no time at all, it was no longer necessary to be to be headed to a gym to slip on a tracksuit and trainers. I love this. Uh, this with all these sneakers right here, girls. It is so curious all over Paris. You see these gorgeous creatures of all ages, of all ages, walking in fabulous clothing, and they're all wearing sneakers for comfort. Girls after my own heart. Look at this little number from Pierre Balmain from 1914. This is a uniform that was used. Look at how pretty that was. I'd wear that today. The Lithuania Olympic jacket. So cool. That was worn in 1992. Lithuania was emerging from the fall of the USSR. Look at this one. Whose is this? 
this one here, let's see, but it was worn for the Winter Beijing Olympics. How cool. Look at this little number. It says here in 1954, the baseball cap became a staple. And you know something? I see New York Yankee baseball caps all over the streets here in Paris. It's so adorable, I love it. Isn't that fabulous? Of course, wing victory draped in the colors of all of the countries. How perfect. And look at this magnificent exhibition of all these different outfits, fashionable and fabulous. There's children becoming, there's a little future designers here. Look at this one. How great is this, Alexander McQueen? Ah, oh, so cool. Who's this guy? This is from Louis Vuitton from 2022. It's pretty cool. Look at that. Um, this has got to be Chanel. Yep, Chanel. Look at this. Little tweed ensemble. Look at the shoes. Oh, wow. Uh, little skateboarders out there. Look at this. J.W. Anderson. We have this little soccer player. I can see um, David Beckham's wife in that. I mean, look at that. That looks like it's right out of Ralph Lauren. Is it? Let's see. John Galliano for Dior. Serena and Venus Williams should have some of their, their outfits that they won their Grand Slams in. Here's some beautiful, beautiful old gowns. Wow. I'll never forget when I saw, I think it was when Ralph Lauren, a shift dress in a jersey with um, three stripes going down the sides. And it was a long gown, it was really. And I thought, wow, 